What's up, comrades? Welcome to this week's episode of Red Library, a political education podcast for today's left. If you're a returning comrade listener, welcome back. Hope you've been doing well. If you're a first-time comrade listener, well, welcome. Also, for the first time, this is getting redundant already. All right, let's just skip this and move on. I'd like to ask you a question. Are you a fan of Game of Thrones? Of the Song of Fire and Ice? Well, we have our lefty political version of that, but our fire and ice are a little bit different. Our fire is spicy questions, spicy analysis, and our ice is ice-cold motherfucking takes. And to bring you just that this week, we have a new guest in the library. My very good dear comrade Maximus is here to guide us through a work by the brilliant British Marxist cultural theorist Stuart Hall called Policing the Crisis, Mugging the State and Law and Order. This is a very, very dense episode. Please check the show notes for lots of references, lots of links to different things that we're going to talk about, such as race and racism, Marxist theories of the state, moral panics, resonance machines, and all sorts of other good stuff. I am very happy to say that this might be one of my favorite episodes that we've done so far, and I hope you're going to feel the same way after listening. Let's jump right into it this week, but please remember to keep supporting Red Library in our various ways we offer to you, dear comrades. Remember to give us those ratings on iTunes. Go down on your podcast catcher app, click on a certain number of stars, maybe write us a couple of lines, let us know what you're thinking. If you'd like to support the show materially, head over to Patreon. Links are in the show notes for that. Maybe throw us a few bucks for as little as $1. You can get access to all of our premium content. And we have our next episode on Bong Joon-ho's excellent film Parasite coming out next week. Or actually maybe the week before this. I don't know. Either way, if you give us a buck, at least you'll get access to that. Like the show on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Run naked through the streets screaming Red Library at the top of your lungs. Maybe we can bail you out or help pay some legal fees with our Patreon money. Just hit us up. Let us know. All right, y'all, here it is, me and Comrade Maximus talking about Stuart Hall's Policing the Crisis. It's a hell of a good ride. Enjoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's up, comrades? Welcome to Red Library. We got a a brand new guest in the library today, an old friend. Hello. Who are you? My name is Max. Oh, shit. Do you want your last name on here? Is that cool? Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't think I have anyone chasing me right now or anything. Well, I mean, let's see how it goes after you do this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) May or may not go on my CV here, depending on what's going on. Can you put podcasts on CVs now? Is that cool? You know, it could probably be like a broader impact public outreach kind of thing. Yeah, I don't know what the... You could totally spin that. Yeah. You, could pull that off. <laughs> you know, we have listeners in like 40-something countries now, Oh, perfect. So yeah, yeah, you could really play that up and make it sound like this is some legit fucking thing that you're doing. Grant proposals really like to see that. <laughs> <laughs> They're not going to like to hear this, though, now that I'm exactly. like saying how the sausage is made here. Well, as someone who, you know, relies on grant funding at the nonprofit that I work at, you know, they don't fucking know what's going on. As long as you just make it sound good and like you're helping poor people people or people of color they're like ah whatever here just take our white people money that's all (laughs) (laughs) i'll take that (laughs) yeah maximus just to give listeners a little context here and just so you know everyone on the show is comrade so you're going to be comrade max i may call you comrade maximus because i've always called you maximus (laughs) in honor of ridley scott's the greatest film of all time gladiator are you not entertained (laughs) you will be after the end of this podcast well and if you're not i mean (laughs) Don't fucking at us on Twitter. <laughs> I thought it might be kind of funny just to let everyone know. You and I met at an ISO event. Yes. Like years ago. Uh-huh. A Marxist lecture. And the speaker yeah. wasn't even that good. Was but not good. The Q&A, I think we got to bantering over a question about the labor theory of value. That's right. And something about diamond markets. 
Yes. I remember that was uh-huh. something. And after I was like, oh, we should talk to this fellow up yeah. here. Because it was our little, uh, our little Marxist gang who showed up. And then mm-hmm. we had pizza and we've been friends ever since. Yeah. Yeah. It was very serendipitous. It was actually. And now you're here in the library recording mm-hmm. this podcast. It's all come full circle. Yeah. And I, I also wanted to let listeners know, just in the interest of transparency and sort of, uh, I mean, podcasting ethics, that you were actually having brunch with some friends. And I pulled up in a nondescript white van and uh, was in a ski mask and military fatigue and I black bagged you and <laughs> I chained you to a radiator in my apartment and I said, Maximus, read this book and then you're going to do a podcast with me on it. Get in, loser. We're going shopping. I'm in my ski mask now. Just uh-huh. so everyone knows. I've got insane Stockholm syndrome going on. <laughs> It's like this like weird sort of dialectical Stockholm syndrome because like I'm also very much in love with you and you're <laughs> the hostage. So who knows how this works? Wow. Okay. Well, we're going to get into the production of consent soon <laughs> enough here. So. You know, I don't think you've probably seen this yet, but did you know that Comrade Don and I just did an 11 part series on Foucault's Society Must Be Defended lectures? Oh, dang. I yeah. did not. Yeah. Because you and I, I think what we had talked about, maybe doing a Foucault book. Maybe yeah. A Discipline book. and Punish, I yeah. think. But then you you said you were going to do that with someone else. So mm-hmm. yeah, okay, shit. Now I'm excited to see this other podcast you've recorded. Yeah, well, it's it's a lot of them. So okay, uh, but that might help listeners know a little bit too of sort of your way of thinking about things. True, I just feel like you've been very influenced by Foucault. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It was. I, I've read Discipline and Punish like three times now, and after picking up some Judith Butler too, it's kind of, I've, I'm just very familiar with that sort of framework of understanding issues, and I don't know, one thing I've, I've liked talking to you about this too, because you've sort of pushed back a little bit on that like Foucaultian interpretation, or at least made me aware of some of the common critiques that, mm-hmm. that are leveraged against him. Yeah, and one of the things, we actually just did uh, an episode with another podcast, a good comrade of ours from Chicago uh, named Neil who has a podcast called From 78, which I think listeners will probably, they'll have those episodes before yours comes out. Okay. Uh, But we actually talk a lot about Foucault and think about Foucault as this ghost that kind of haunts Mm. sort of Marxist political thinking. And so I think this is the book we're going to do today is actually kind of perfect because the the author in question, if there is still an author that exists, is actually very influenced by Foucault as well. Yeah, kind of this nightmare weighing on the brain of the living, if you will. <laughs> Which uh, we do indeed. Yeah. <laughs> um, anything else do you want to touch on before maybe talk I a little bit about what we're here to do? Thinks, I think we can just get into it here right now then. All right. Well, what was your book of choice to share with our comrade listeners? So the book I picked here was Policing the Crisis. Let me read the full subtitle over here, Mugging the State and Law and Order. Primary author here is Stuart Hall, but there's a couple of other authors here as well. I'm most familiar with Stuart Hall, so I can't really uh, speak to the others. The thing that got me interested in this book mainly was, well, you can kind of hear from the title that you know, someone coming from Foucault would be very interested in issues of mugging the state law and order. But Hall has like a much more, uh, much more Marxist perspective mm-hmm. on everything. And I heard about Stuart Hall on some sort of podcast or something to you had i was wondering if we were going to touch on this yeah yeah we had you and i like discovered this other series of podcasts about Stuart hall but it ended up being more biographical Mm -hmm. and less about sort of the content of his theory but yeah this guy i mean one of the founders of the new left review and along with uh raymond williams and ep thompson i think okay yeah Yeah, and grandfather of cultural studies and Mm -hmm. i'm like how have i not heard of this person yet yeah it's interesting because Stuart Hall was one of those people that I would start to hear his name places and hear people talk about Hall's work and how it influenced them, but didn't like directly engage with him until Mm. I read a book of his, I think it's called Representation, uh, Cultural Studies and Signifying Practices. Okay, And I still, to this day, think it is one of the most clear, beautifully written, uh, powerful, I guess, representations of studying things like language and cultural representation Mm. and media and photography and film. And it also has a lot of really cool pictures because, you know, (laughs) I can't read those big words real good. Um, (laughs) But it's it's a phenomenal book. And so I read that a number of maybe a couple of years ago. And so I was super excited for this book because, yeah, the podcast that you mentioned, actually a professor at the the university around around these parts, he was kind of a very, seemed like a very Marxist-influenced sociologist from the UK named Ben Carrington. And he's mm, written a lot mm-hmm. about 
sort of like sociology and class and race and sports in the UK. Um, and I think he used to be a professional football player. Oh, really? Which is pretty <laughs> awesome. He's like a professional football player and becomes like a fucking Marxist sociologist. Which yeah. Which is like mad respect for that. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, that was kind of what I had heard and an old mentor of mine mentioned that to me who knew Professor Carrington. And so, yeah, just kind of led to a, a chain of events, which leads us here. I yeah. had sort of a similar, I think I heard Ben Carrington speak where he was the one that first mentioned this and he's on that podcast. Mm-hmm. too um and yeah i had picked up a Stuart hall article called what is this black and black popular culture that article is fucking legit Didn't yeah we read that together yeah once? for discussion yeah, that's right yeah, yeah and it as you said you know just like so lucid and clear mm-hmm. it's like and only y- everyone wrote that way who's sort of in that ballpark i know and it's what maybe like 40 30 years old at this point but it feels so relevant and contemporary yeah. today it always kind of reminded me of, um, oh shit, what's his name? Who wrote The Ways of Seeing? Is it uh, John Berger? Or John Berger? No, I don't know. Anyway, I'm maybe I'll post a link to that. He also has a similar way of somehow tackling these issues of like cultural representation and like class and race and film and somehow makes it accessible and not doesn't sacrifice anything in the analysis, which is, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I think very, very rare to encounter that. Yeah. And what I like so much about these sort of like Marxist cultural theorists is they're analyzing me media and culture, not just on a level of, of aesthetics, um, mm-hmm. but sort of, yeah, like an underlying historical material kind of analysis and really getting at like some deep political insights and messages for political action from yeah. looking at things like movies and mm-hmm. music. One other cool thing too, and I, I think at some point we'll probably do maybe a, a comparative reading between Stuart Hall and uh, Paul Gilroy, who's another black Marxist sociological thinker, uh, does a lot of work on post-colonial studies. One of the things I always really appreciated about how both of them approach categories of race and colonialism, especially from the UK. So Hall was born in Jamaica and then eventually sort of went and got, I think he was a Rhodes Scholar or something. Yeah. Yeah. And uh-huh. ended up studying like literature in the UK. Uh, but Gilroy, and I can't remember exactly where Gilroy where he's from, but similar situation. Was born in the Caribbean, um, basically studied literature and philosophy and ended up in the UK. And they were both sort of, to me, writing in very similar ways. They always have this fascinating way of talking about racial categories as these sort of like philosophical, sociological thinkers from the UK and how race is always something that's continually being reproduced and constructed. Mm -hmm. Um, And the way that they sort of bring that to bear on how they think about race in in social contexts and in media, I've always found really powerful. Mm -hmm. One of the things I took away from from Stuart Hall in this book, uh, Policing the Crisis, was he's sort of bringing the historical back into historical materialism, uh, much kind of in the sense of Gramsci as well. Yeah. Uh, Would you say that Hall is doing his version of bringing sexy back? (laughs) Yeah, Gramsci's version of sexy is is coming back here. You know, I don't know if I've ever heard the words Gramsci and sexy muttered in the same sentence, but we need more of that. We need to return the sexual back into our our dimension of politics. Oh, yeah, we can bring in some Judith Butler here, too, and the sexual reproduction of the labor force as well. No, that sounds good. But yeah, anyway, so... (laughs) Anyway, moving on. (laughs) Moving on from that weird reference I just made. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, the way Hall brings the historical back into historical materialism is through this in-depth analysis of race and how it relates to sort of the underlying material base that's playing out specifically in in this book here in the context of like 60s and 70s Europe, specifically the UK. When was this book published? Was it the 80s sometime? I looked and it was published in 1978. So he's okay, cool. talking a lot of these developments that happened in the early 70s, uh, late 60s. But also more generally, kind of post-war Europe. Is there any other details about Hall that you touched on or like looked up or found out about just so people have more of a context for him? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think so. I I think we pretty much covered it. That's about as as much that informs my understanding of Hall's identity as, as we've discussed. Yeah, I know um, whenever he he was the initial founding editor of New Left Review, but he left actually after a couple okay. of years, there was a bit of a falling out between him. And I think, mm. I can't remember the exact story, but there was definitely some issues and he left. But he was also involved in the CPGB, the Communist Party of Great Britain, Okay, um, did some theoretical work for them. I think one thing he's still kind of known for is his analysis. He was sort of a very early sort of like prophetic analyzer of neoliberalism and the mm. Thatcher era. 
And he sort of saw a lot of those things coming, you know, maybe before a lot of other thinkers, even like Marxist thinkers did. So maybe at some point later on the show, you know, we might have to talk about Daniel neoliberalism a little bit. Yeah, that's right in this era. Definitely. And that's a lot of the sort of like ideological and material understanding that he brings to this, this moral panic that emerges around mugging in Mm -hmm. 1970s Britain. Any, uh, any other thoughts before we dig into this? this Uh, I don't think so. Maybe I should just kind of give a brief overview of the book and sure you're running the show so however you want to tackle it and translate it teach Uh, it all right yeah Yeah. so i mean the elevator speech here is that you know hall and others begin with this with a look at this crime of mugging and the moral panic that emerges around mugging in in britain in the early 1970s so hall starts out with sort of a very in-depth analysis of these criminological studies and eventually concludes that this moral panic doesn't arise as some sort of necessary response to an increase in violent street crime or anything like that, but rather locates the origins of, of mugging and the moral panic around mugging in, in ongoing economic and political developments. That leads to a whole sort of neo-Marxist theory and analysis of the state, media, judiciary, British politics, and the role of of the lumpen proletariat and black youth in in Marxist revolution. Okay, so whenever we think about moral panic, I definitely know in the States around the same period, or maybe a little bit before this, there was this huge crime wave. And the way that that huge crime wave was used as a justification by not just Republicans, but also Democrats, which is typically forgotten, Mm -hmm. and also in some black communities themselves, to justify the birth of the war on crime and the war on drugs Mm -hmm. and the sort of militarization of the police. And so the aspect of a moral panic as a ideological justification of that, I know here was, was really important. So for Hall... Do you have a sense of whenever he talks about moral panic, like what exactly is he describing with that phrase? Right. Yeah. Great question. So I pulled a quote here, and this is actually uh, a quote that that Hall pulls from a guy named Stan Cohen from a text called Folk Devils and Moral Panic, um, which I think takes a look at, I don't know, some group called Mods and Rockers. And uh, (laughs) yeah, the Jets and the Sharks (laughs) and kind of the public reaction to the this. Okay. A group of group of youths here. The two youths. Uh, uh, to what? So, anyways, the quote from Stan Cohen is: "Societies appear to be subject every now and then to periods of moral panic. A condition, episode, person, or group emerges to become defined as a threat to societal values and interests. Its nature is presented in a stylized and stereotypical fashion by the mass media. The moral barricades are manned by editors, bishops, politicians, and other right-thinking people." Socially accredited experts pronounce their diagnoses and solutions. Ways of coping are evolved or more often re- resorted to. The condition then disappears, submerges, or deteriorates and becomes more visible. Sometimes the object of the panic is quite novel, and at other times it is something which has been in existence long enough, but suddenly appears in the limelight. Sometimes the panic is passed over and is forgotten, except in folklore and collective memory. At other times it has more serious and long-lasting repercussions with which might produce such changes as those in legal and social policy, or even the way society conceives itself. So that quote from there is kind of the the definition of Stuart Hall, huh. uh, that Stuart okay. Hall is, is operating under. Yeah, where this person or group emerges as some sort of pariah, some threat to how society conceives of itself and its values and interests. And it's often, you know, that threat is often caricatured and exaggerated. Yeah. And Stuart Hall is, it kind of falls into this position that that mugging is is actually something that's that's been in existence for a while, but appears in this new limelight. And that's one of the things I really appreciated about his criminological analysis is he kind of, he pushes back on this assumption that crime rates actually are are increasing Mm -hmm. and cites evidence like, well, mugging doesn't have like a precise legal definition Mm -hmm. and kind of emerges as a term in the early 70s, sort of in synchronous with with when the perceived increase in mugging was emerging. So would you say for Hall, he sees the the deployment of the the word mugging as sort of this kind of almost like it's arising to describe this sort of thing that was maybe a little ambiguous, but it's arising to serve like a very particular political ideological purpose. Exactly. It's, It's almost a sort of label that's created 
to describe violent street crime that had been in, in existence for for quite a long time. I think things like Jack the Ripper that have existed in British folklore mm-hmm. and, and sort of, yeah. Yeah, like bronies too. Yeah. <laughs> what um, political purpose do you think that's serving? Oh, leave it up to the <laughs> good question there. That's going to be a whole nother podcast. <laughs> <laughs> historical materials analysis of brony culture amazing yeah we should actually <laughs> I'd read that, that article I, I would yeah i mean i would read a whole damn book about that <laughs> so i'm curious because i think in the states the idea of moral panic is something that is profoundly influential or moral panics themselves i think sometimes whenever they arise we don't typically recognize something as a moral panic it in a purely ideological way. We just take it as being self-evident and a reflection of a coherent sort of reality that's underlying it. I was wondering, do you remember any moral panics for you growing up? Anything jump to mind? Yeah, great question. I mean, I don't even think I need to go back into my childhood to look at the emergence of moral panics. I think we're kind of seeing it now with the way immigrants are demonized in the mm-hmm. United States. Um, you know, the caravan comes to mind. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good example. Um, yeah. I, I think there might even be some sort of moral panic around like very liberal progressive youths and climate protesters as oh, well. Like Greta Thunberg and stuff? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I was reading some some blog posts looking at Stuart Hall prior to this podcast as well. And I guess in Europe, they're talking about moral panics around debt crises as well. And the way that sort of like the Greek government has sort of been the object mm. of, uh, yeah, uh, the object of the moral panic for mismanagement of debt. That's really fascinating because I think sometimes whenever I think about moral panics, the first thing that jumps to mind, and I was very young whenever this happened, but there was a huge moral panic around satanic cults Mm. of young teenagers dressed in black listening to Marilyn Manson and sacrificing Mm -hmm. animals out in the woods. Yeah, This is actually a very very real thing around where I grew up, and there was a a particular part of our very small rural town where there was a a dilapidated shack, and that was where all the animal sacrifices took place. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that's the one that jumps out. But I I guess for me... I always think about moral panics tend to be very uh, culturally focused and usually very religious in nature underneath. Mm. Uh, So the idea of thinking about like Syriza in Greece and the way that the economic crisis was handled, that in itself being moral panic, that's a really uh, new way for me to think about that. Yeah, because I think Hall's sort of analysis of these moral panics is there's there's ultimately s- some class fraction mm. that gets demonized or is becomes the object of this moral panic. Actually, that's a really helpful way for me to think about it too, because even whenever I was a kid thinking about this sort of moral panic around like Satanism and like heavy metal and stuff, it was always this sort of working class group of kids who tended to gravitate towards those sorts of aesthetics and like ways of dressing and like cultural consumption Mm -hmm. and and it was you know at the time again this is why it's helpful to think about stuff in this way there was no idea that there was a class division that was actually sort of at the core of that right it was very much like focused on a particular group of like young working class kids or something like that it's just like you never Mm -hmm. thought about it that way it was inherently a cultural thing right yeah and i'm just thinking too because i remember marilyn manson was sort of demonized during the columbine incident oh yeah that's Um, right yeah and yeah was was had some interviews on this on this topic and he i I remember his response is sort of getting to the heart of almost exposing this moral panic that emerged and yeah yeah the victimization uh, or uh, not victimization but the scapegoating of of Mm -hmm. Satanists. Yeah. So I have a little bit of a spicy question to ask you. Are you ready? Yeah, hit me. Do you think that the terror around the recent Joker film and the anticipation of a mass shooting occurring because of the film itself, would you also describe, again, not saying that mass shootings aren't happening at, you know, a high frequency, but would you say that our fear around white male incel mass shooters is also a moral panic at this point? Ooh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's, I I wouldn't characterize the sort of moral panic that's emerged around white mass shooters as as ubiquitous enough to mm-hmm. maybe constitute a moral panic and you don't see the sort of public response that's being mobilized to actually tackle this issue unfortunately i should caveat this whole discussion and hall has a similar sort of caveat that he doesn't he's not morally approving of of mugging or taking an ethical stance a, around some of these actions that are being done he's sort of 
of being a little bit more agnostic on that front and instead turning to a sociological analysis of why those panics emerge while refraining from any sort of moral judgments. Like a good Marxist should. Yeah. Uh I just want to be clear. I'm not sort of approving of of mass (laughs) shootings in any sense. Uh So, you know, again, this is going to be on your CV and now it's going to be preserved in the the digital records forever that you are promoting and pro mass shooting. Oh, man. (laughs) Sorry, Max. You didn't expect this today, did you? (laughs) I mean, I think that's part of the importance for this this analysis, though, that Hall's doing is that when we can sort of peel back these scapegoats that are used as explanations for Mm. some of these tragedies that occur, we can actually start addressing the underlying structural issues that are leading to the emergence in the first place. So you got to get my anarchist snaps for that. We actually talked about that on our episode about the Joker, the recent Joker. Oh, yeah. Because that's, that was sort of our take on it, is that a lot of the, the sort of hot takes that were being sort of leveled at the film were very much about the Joker is this protagonist, and how can you like this film if this is the protagonist? And our sort of read of it was essentially that just because he's the protagonist doesn't mean that it's a moral approval of what the character and what he does. The point is, is to say you have to peel back these layers and look at Joker as like a scapegoat, but really it's about these larger structural historical forces going on underneath the surface. That's really what we're trying to analyze Mm -hmm. here. So it's interesting that Hall kind of sees mugging or or wants to approach mugging in a similar way. Right, yeah, that it emerges as this sort of, uh, to get a little Foucauldian on here, that it emerges as this explanation for why why mugging arises and that this is the the intelligible knowledge about what causes mugging and Mm -hmm. what causes this threat of violence and increase in street violence. You had a mention earlier about sort of this consensus that emerges even among Democrats and Republicans in the United States around around the rise in, in drug crime mm-hmm. uh, in the 70s and the 60s. And I think that that was a great observation because that's really what Hall gets into is that this ideological consensus emerges around mugging as well. And that the sort of political distinctions between liberals and conservatives are, are sort of a, a difference in type of sort of, well, how much should we punish this? What yeah, should the right. sentence be mm-hmm. without a sort of criticism of, as you said, the underlying structural causes that, that are leading to, to some of these episodes? That's really interesting. I mean, again, I think that's such a great book to do because of how relevant a lot of these same sorts of analyses that Hall, it's pretty clear, is already offering are for how we think about criminal justice and racial disparities in policing and all this other stuff in the U.S. Mm-hmm. You know, that have been here for as long as the police have been an institution. Yeah, exactly. Which started with slave patrols, just in case anyone True. didn't notice that. True, yeah. And that's why I like the criminological analysis that he starts with in the beginning to kind of dismantle this understanding that, that crime is, or that muggings are on the rise. And um, I, I'm wondering, too, would you say that part of what Hall is critiquing is how a lot of times whenever we think about crime and maybe mugging, that there's this very objective cold description of these things as statistics and he's trying to like get it how statistics are themselves ideological and how they're deployed right yeah there is actually i I just want to bring in sort of like a a fun tidbit or i don't know if fun is the right word for it but something i never thought about was when we hear about like this increase in in mugging for example that increase can sort of be fabricated when the police start targeting muggers more yeah Mm -hmm. and so what seems to be like the sort of objective statistical increase can actually have its origins you know in this very sort of like hidden policing policy that's get that gets implemented within the confines of a police department and isn't any sort of like public discussion i think that is such an important thing too because the the way that certain laws are applied with the discretion of the officers themselves Mm -hmm. really can obscure the way that these sorts of rise in statistics look very objective. But a lot of this has to do with, yeah, the cultures of police in particular departments and how they're being instructed to enforce certain policies or not. I think about stop and frisk. I mean, that's a huge one. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's it's a really important thing to sort of critique. I'm also thinking about, did you ever watch The Wire? 
No, I haven't. Get the fuck off my I show. Know. <laughs> I th- you would love it. I think I, especially after it's been this on book. my list for a while. Yeah, I mean the first couple episodes can be a little slow, but hang in there because I I still stick by the uh, the judgment that it's the greatest TV series of all time. But there's this really fascinating way it depicts police departments in Baltimore and the way that they use objective numbers and statistics to evaluate how effective they're being. Um, but there's this really amazing uh, thread that they run through the show about how everyone is doing what they call juking the stats and how the way that their departments are being evaluated is oh like oh how many drug arrests did you make how many corners did you clear but the whole thing becomes just this this fucking ruse that like everyone is juking the stats and trying to make it appear as if they're increasing their enforcement and stopping drug crime and it's this really great this is almost kind of a lacanian thing where everyone knows the stats are being juked and everyone is okay with it unless someone deliberately and very consciously says that the stats are being juked. It's this sort of shared delusion that everyone is operating on, and it works just fine as long as no one actually says it out loud that that's actually what hmm. we're doing. What's the violation? Parking in a bus stop, expired registration. First class police work, Baker. Yeah, well, this is a word from up on high, straight from the eighth floor downtown. Blessed bosses juking stats for the new administration. I know you think it's bullshit, but I spend my shift where they tell me. <laughs> Baker, let me tell you a little secret. The controlling officer on his beat is the one true dictatorship in America. We can lock a guy up on a humble, we can lock him up for real, or we can say fuck it. Pull under the expressway and drink ourselves to death. And our side partners will cover it. So no one, and I mean no one, tells us how to waste our shift. Yeah, and uh, Hall talks about uh, what he calls signification spirals in this policing the crisis. I fucking love that phrase. I love Stuart Hall. (laughs) Just because he says shit like that. Yeah, and in like his typical lucidity, he sort of like enumerates uh, like steps one through eight that constitute these signification spirals. He's so good with that too, giving those like bulleted lists about here's this very abstract phrase, but now I'm going to lay it out in a super clear way. So okay. Well, can we talk about what's... Yep. So hit me with that signification spiral knowledge, Maximus. So Stuart Hall says the signification spiral is a way of signifying events which also intrinsically escalates their threat. The notion of a signification spiral is similar to that of an amplification spiral as developed by certain sociologists of deviance. An, ampl- an amplification spiral suggests that reaction has the effect, under certain conditions, not of lessening but of increasing deviance. The signification spiral is a self amplifying sequence within the area of signification the activity or event with which the signification deals is escalated made to seem more threatening within the course of the signification itself a signification spiral seems always to contain at least some of the following elements and here's that bulleted list for you one the identification of a specific issue of concern two the identification of a subversive minority three the convergence or the linking by labeling of the specific issue to other problems four the notion of thresholds which once crossed can lead to an escalating threat Five, the prophecy of more troubling times to come if no action is taken, often in our case by way of references to the U.S., the paradigm example. And six, the call for firm steps. There are two key notions, convergence and thresholds, which are the escalating mechanisms of the spiral. So I think sort of one of the important takeaways from this, yeah, I mean, it's it's hard not to see the uh, what you described in this mm-hmm. juking the statistics yeah. in this description of signification spirals. And I think Hall is, is using this as a reference to also not, not just how police stations work, but sort of how the media covers crime and how discussions of crime of amp- are amplified in the public discourse. I think one of the interesting choice of words is this use of the word signification, that it's also something that happens in the way events and people are represented to kind of emphasize that this isn't something purely objective and yeah. statistical, uh, that there's really some some action of representation that's going on here. So let's maybe pause on that because this is such a core theme in, in Hall's work. So whenever we talk about signification and its its relationship to how we represent things, does he give any discussion about whenever he talks about signification, what exactly is does he mean or what he's drawing on for that as a concept? I, I don't think 
he has a, a specific definition. I think he's drawing on a lot of uh, Marx here where mm-hmm. he kind of discusses the forms of appearance. Mm-hmm. Um, so Marx will, you know, discuss things where he'll talk about the relationship between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, but how this takes the form of, of appearance as an exchange for like an honest day's wage for an honest day's work yeah. in the marketplace. And that this form of appearance is, I mean, it, it's real. It has actual material significance for the people involved, but the way it, it's presented in, in this marketplace format sort of obscures how, how the, the inequality that is actually at the basis of that relationship. Yeah. And if I remember my, my marks correctly, it would be the material relations between things sort of obscures the social relations between people. Excellent. Yeah. That's a great summary. Yeah. So if we use Hall's bulleted list here of signification spirals and just as a way to make it really concrete and relevant and apply it, how would you use this as a way to analyze, uh, let's say, the terror of MS-13 and, like you said, like the Mm. caravan and Mm -hmm. this idea of the murders and rapists coming across the border? So what would Hall be able to give us and how we can analyze this sort of signification and cultural discourse around this? Right. Yeah. Great question. I mean, okay, so that sort of tackles number one this identification of a specific area of concern, Mm -hmm. that being immigration in this case. And then two is the identification of a subversive minority, which Latinx people of of Central America is essentially the subversive minority there. Yeah, and not only that, but MS-13 and cartels and this very sort of the lumpen element from a completely different national and cultural context, it seems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the use of subversive here is is pretty key to that. That it, that it is this minority that's the locus of yeah. all these social issues. I guess that's that's also three here, the linking by labeling of the specific issue to other problems. So, so yeah, I'm wondering in terms of like signification, because one thing that might be also helpful too is this idea of, of signification always reminds me of the French linguist Ferdinand de Saussure, who has been really influential on people like Foucault and Butler and God, I mean, all this sort of like theoretical work that came out of this period of how there's a a signifier and then there's the thing that it signifies. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, is Hall kind of getting at that what happens in this, uh, these sort of signification spirals is that you're taking a particular or like, let's say a subset of a particular group, and then you're signifying as if that particular stands in for the whole group itself. Right, yeah. So like everyone from like Nicaragua or like El Salvador or wherever, it's like, oh, everyone is like part of a gang Mm -hmm. or a a cartel or something. Right, that asylum seekers are just the same as EB-13 members. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think even broader than that too, that the idea that immigrants are linked with crime and sort Mm -hmm. of the the destabilization of what the so-called public understands to be American yeah. and as antithetical to American values, that that sort of linking is also what's occurring mm. when this this subversive minority is identified as a threat. The next point here is sort of this notion of, of thresholds with which once crossed can lead to an escalating threat. Mm-hmm. So, and I, I think you kind of see this these days with sort of, I don't know, some of these white nationalist conspiracies about how if some level of immigration is crossed, that all of white culture will be obliterated. Or yeah, this white notion. genocide. Exactly. It's real. It's yeah. Real, Max. <laughs> Great replacement theory is real. <laughs> Have I mean, you ever seen any of the videos that try to describe this theory? No, I, oh, I've I'm not gonna been like too afraid things. to go into dark corners of the internet there. So. I do not fear to tread in those dark areas uh, to my own detriment, perhaps. But I there was a while back, uh, I think, in relation to some unspecified political work I was involved in, I'll leave it at that, that I ended up stumbling across a, an actual video that that was put out by some, you know, just very strange race realist, like white, white nationalist YouTube channel where they, it's like 18 minutes of them trying to describe the great replacement theory. It is literally the most incoherent nonsense I've ever Mm. heard in my life. Oh God! Yeah, yeah, I'm not linking that shit, but you know those are out there. If uh-huh. you wanted to check them yeah, out. yeah, unfortunately. And Hall also does. He sort of uh, looks at a sort of proto example of maybe some of these really vitriolic internet threads when Hall looks at 
these these letters to the to newspapers that are written by I, he calls them crank letters that are you know sort of written by people who are like oh these muggers should have like been put to death by firing squad in Holy the public fuck. and yeah, well yeah uh, man that that is eerie how how reminiscent that is of a lot yeah of and now. I think that's like part of the contemporary power that Hall and his analysis has and what I like about Hall too is he doesn't sort of just dismiss these as these crank letters or something I mean he doesn't he doesn't pick apart the logic that's being invoked in these but sort of identifies how some of these positions are just more extreme versions of some of the ideological consensus that already exists so this yeah. consensus around that that mugging should be punished and that these crank letters just sort of like take them to their almost logical extreme and uses these crank letters as evidence for exposing some of that ideological consensus that exists around mugging. But I think the power of his methodology is that it can be applied to, you know, immigration as well. I think that is maybe one of the most useful points of analysis that we can use around politics in the U.S. right now, especially between, you know, this quote unquote, like divide between like liberals and conservatives is that in a lot of ways, the fundamental ideological bedrock is the same. It's just that particular groups might like mm-hmm. amplify it in a certain way, but the same logic applies. And that's one of the things that always strikes me as so disingenuous and needs to be like ruthlessly attacked and torn down is whenever, you know, someone who has like a very like mainstream liberal position who might posture in a certain way about having care and concern for like oppressed and exploited peoples or like different aspects of criminal justice. But really underneath of that, it's like, it may not be as brutal on its surface, but the logic is still there. Exactly. You know, about yes, we need to police certain groups and like the police and criminal justice are in itself the correct answer to these larger prevailing social problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you see this with sort of some contemporary liberal positions on immigration as well, mm-hmm. where it's sort of like, Oh, immigrants aren't that bad. Um, it's sort of still in this, this ideology of lumping sort of all immigrants together under this one sort of group yeah. and mm-hmm. kind of just contesting the maybe like like little signification of whether they're whether they represent or diverge from so-called American values. Yeah, you know, I think one of the interesting things that I was talking with a few people about recently is that Slavoj Žižek had written a book called The Double Blackmail, and it was about the refugee crisis in Western Europe. And a lot of people really hated that book and really were really pissed about it because his argument is essentially that even if you're this sort of enlightened Western European like EU liberal who thinks oh yes like no like refugees and immigrants aren't bad like they're all good people like invite them all in and his his response to this was that this is essentially just sort of like a positive stereotypical racist ideological Mm -hmm. way of thinking about this and his argument was that listen like refugees and immigrants from Syria or Yemen or wherever it might be it's like listen they're human beings and they're capable of evil and crime the way that everyone is it's like you Mm. should accept them not because they're good but because they're just as human and possibly evil (laughs) as any of us are Mm -hmm. and a lot of people like Mm -hmm. really butt against that argument very hard and i think part of why they do is because it fundamentally challenges this liberal conception that oh the way that we should counteract this conservative anti-immigrant narrative is just to say they're all great people Mm -hmm. and and put them on this like pedestal as if like they're not human right but it still relies on this sort of fundamental assumption that they're distinct from europeans yeah Uh they're they're this other thing that's like that isn't human in the same way that we are. Right, like yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think this is a great sort of segue into into Stuart Hall's theory of the state that he describes here and where he draws on Gramsci a bunch and specifically this production of consent that happens. So maybe we can get into that that's, here now. That's my shit right All there. Right. So you want to, um, just for listeners who may not be aware, you want to give a quick spiel about Antonio Gramsci? Uh, yeah, I mean, you probably know more about this guy than I do, but I know he's one of these Italian Marxists that was active at the beginning of the 20th century. Mm-hmm. And sort of going along with my tagline from earlier, he kind of puts the historical back in historical materialism. Like a boss. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> I I think he's most famously known for coining the term hegemony. Mm-hmm. And there's some encyclopedias that just under Antonio Gramsci say, see hegemony. Yeah, that's right. I think I've seen some of those. Also was really influential in his use of the category, the subaltern. Mm. Um, developed concepts such as war of maneuver, 
War of Position. Mm-hmm. Uh, he wrote a lot about Machiavelli and like the role right. of the state yeah. in Italy, especially. It's pretty fascinating. He eventually died being in prison right? from the fascists. Yeah, mm-hmm. from Mussolini's regime. Yeah. What I like about his, I mean, he's reacting against this sort of dominating material Marxism that's existing around the early 20th century. You know, this sort of notion that Marx has this almost like Hegelian dialectic that's operating where there's this progression via synthesis thesis from, say, from capitalism to this proletariat revolution that's going to sort of happen naturally once capitalism reaches a certain level of development. Mm -hmm. And what I like about Gramsci is he sort of explores the role of that ideology and history plays to sort of dismantle that there's going to be this this natural progression that emerges in, in economies and, and proletariat revolution and really centers the role that ideology plays and why he ends up emphasizing this, this war of position. Yeah, and also a really key historical point here as well is that he's also responding to the successful Bolshevik revolution in Russia and trying to say that the material conditions involving civil institutions and the role that culture and ideology play are going to be fundamentally different if there's going to be any similar sort of revolution in a place like Italy or Germany. So that's that's also, I think, the enduring legacy of his influence is the way that we think about civil institutions in relation to the state and mm-hmm. revolutionary movements. Right, yeah. You're just reminding me of a, a, a quote, something along the lines that he said, in Russia, the state was everything. Whereas in Western Europe, there's a much more built up bourgeois civil society that mm-hmm. exists. And so part of the reason that Gramsci says the revolution in uh, the communist revolution in Russia was able to be successful was they didn't have this sort of uh, this built up bourgeois society that existed separate from the state. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. one could dismantle the state and and everything would follow. Mm-hmm. Whereas, whereas in other civil societies, there's this more built up bourgeois civil society that also has to be dismantled. You can't just sort of replace the people who are the formal heads of power in yeah. the government. Yeah, because the civil institutions are largely responsible for creating the conditions of consent and mm-hmm. uh, this sort of hegemonic uh, control of not only institutions, but state and also the way that identity and subjectivity are experienced. And so that's a big part. I don't think we've really touched on this with Gramsci specifically, but a lot of the things we do talk about on the show, it's it's kind of a legacy of that, of how you have to understand how in these contexts context, the role that culture and ideology play and the the hegemony that the sort of dominant classes have over those things is a fundamental point and a fundamental uh, thing that has to be challenged and dismantled. Yeah. So maybe we can go in and kind of pick apart some of these these pieces of the terms we're using here. So, I mean, I think, yeah, you would agree that that Gramsci and, and Hall's starting point is that the state is fundamentally a ruling class institution. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that ruling class might have multiple competing factions. It, what the state actually does might diverge from, from those ruling cr- class interests from time to time. But fundamentally, the state is a ruling class institution. You know, in capitalism, it ends up being this this bourgeois institution. But the the bourgeoisie need not be formally in power mm. for, for the state to operate. And this is where this rule by the production of consent becomes key. So let's let's slow that down a little bit. So whenever mm-hmm. Hall says that the, the bourgeoisie don't necessarily need to be in power for the state to function this way. So what exactly do you think he means? That the state itself is defined as like a bourgeois form? Or yeah, what do you take that to mean? Yeah, I mean, I don't think so in, in capitalism, yes, bourgeois form. But I think he wants to say that, you know, the state is something that exists across different sorts of economic structures. Mm, so what okay. the particular ruling class is at the time will determine whose interest the state is serving ultimately. That's really interesting. So it's kind of like if you're a hyper elite wealthy family, such as the Koch brothers, that you have such a huge influence on the state through your economic power and like cultural power and how you can influence these things that that becomes sort of more deterministic of what the state is. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to collapse it to some sort of, to the level of kind of conspiracy where there's this kind of cabal of wealthy capitalists that are pulling the strings and Mm -hmm. puppeteering the the actions of the government so i never expected trump charging into a goblin's nest to not get some goblin vomit and slop and blood on him i just don't want to catch him in bed with a goblin i don't want to see him kissing goblins 
having political succubus with goblins. I don't want to see him ingratiating goblins. And I, I think for Hall, what's really important is the level of autonomy that the state has separate from, from the ruling class. That is such a crucial point, too, because one of the real weaknesses in any sort of conspiratorial narrative about the state just being totally determined by, like, elites or bankers or whoever the fuck they think it is, is that, I mean, I always see two key distinctions. I mean, one, this structural thing about the state has relative autonomy from those and functions in different ways. But then also kind of a Lacanian point too, that almost as if like those elites also don't necessarily have this sort of cohesiveness or this sort of wholeness the way right. that we ascribe to them where they, mm -hmm. they absolutely know what they're doing and this is all this intentional thing. It's like they're just as flawed and like fractured as anyone else. Mm -hmm. So to ascribe them this sort of like deified power is in itself a kind of almost like a psychoanalytic error to make. Right, yeah, that actually there, there, there are these sort of different competing factions that exist within the bourgeoisie itself mm -hmm. even, and the the state's relative autonomy is actually necessary for the preservation of capitalism because it has to kind of intervene on some of these different factions to to police them appropriately or sort of keep them in check so that the essential that's within capitalism can persist. Yeah, would you say that it's almost necessary for the state to intervene and help ensure a stability? Because if there wasn't, the sort of the ruling factions would probably just destroy themselves in like irrational Ex yeah, violent competition. Yeah. Exactly. And these are sort of these these spirals of contradictions mm -hmm. that Marx describes too. Yeah. And I, I think why part of Gramsci and Hall's analysis is so powerful is because it can identify these these state mechanisms that exist to sort of mitigate those those mm -hmm. contradictions that, that Marx describes. So continuing with with Hall's interpretation of, of how the state rules and maybe pinning down some of these terms is, is Hall sees the state ruling as both by coercion and by the production of consent. Mm -hmm. So this coercion is sort of maybe the more, the older kind of conspiratorial notion of how the state rules this this method by domination and, and rule by force. Yeah, so, such as through institutions like the police and the military and these sort of like violent, very graphic displays of state power. Exactly, yeah, yeah. and also punishment that's enacted by the courts as well. Mm -hmm. This is sort of like the form that the state relies on in these early, think maybe like enlightened despots in, in 18th century Europe. Yeah. Also, just to give a shout out to our good old boy, Mickey Foucault, that first chapter of Discipline and Punish, the, mm -hmm. the spectacle of the public execution, which is to sort yeah. of basically display the state's power over life and death. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's sort of like the first facet of how the state rules and what's always underlying the power of the state. But what Hall really emphasizes is the second method of, of, of rule, which is the production of consent. So this is the state's ability, or I guess civil society's ability to give this perception that the state is operating on behalf of the people mm. rather than the ruling classes. And so I think this is an important point because you know, for Hall, the state is fundamentally a ruling class institution. But via the production of consent, it can take on the form of appearance that it's acting on behalf of the people, behalf of whatever the nation is. So what would be maybe some examples? Yeah, so one of the great examples of this production of consent that I think comes to mind, for me at least, is this Nixon silent, silent majority that exists in the 70s United States. This idea that there's this... You know, he's trying to sort of produce this consent that there exists this majority out there that is just invisible. Mm -hmm. um, but the silent majority kind of becomes a mean, a means by which you know, Nixon can express his policies as being the will of the people. Yeah. So almost as if at that time, political institutions, the state didn't necessarily like represent that majority in the way that was most uh, coherent with their interests. And so Nixon sort of signifies as if there's this thing out there and that's what he's ruling in the name of is mm -hmm. the silent majority and so that's the sort of consent process yeah and there's this weird sort of way that it can almost become kind of self-fulfilling here mm -hmm. too that that the labeling of the silent majority and giving this kind of cohesive policy proposal around the interests of that silent majority then people come to understand certain policy and uh issues in terms of that characterization and fall on certain sides of that in that within that framework i think this is such a powerful thing that continues to happen today and almost 
I would say as a legacy of that particular point around Nixon and like the discussion of like the silent majority, I would not recommend that people read this book. But a while back, I read uh, Nixon Land. Have you ever heard of this book? I don't think so. No. Um, Nixon Land by uh, Rick Perlstein ends that book with this statement that essentially what we call the culture wars now and this, you know, the sort of division between liberal and conservative and the fracturing of America has its genesis in this period of Nixon. I remember, you know, what was so important about that. And and again, I'm not necessarily, I don't even think it's like really that great of a book. I mean, I'm not recommending people read it, but it is important to think about how in some ways that these policy positions, once they get labeled as certain things, they get signified as certain things. It almost like retroactively can create a sort of consent to certain sorts of Mm -hmm. like political parties or positions or hating or loving certain policies based on how they get signified. So we've talked about this on a past episode that if you look at polls like folks in the U.S. right now that, you know, a vast majority of them are in favor of universal health care, of wealth redistribution. But whenever you put a name like, oh, this is a democratic policy, then they fucking hate it. Right. And yeah. so I think this is a really important way that this functions right now in the States, mm-hmm. at least. The way like whether you phrase it as Obamacare or the yeah. ACA can drastically alter the polling. I guess I want to emphasize, too, that this is not sort of just at the level of political issues or, uh, you know, political science sides as well Mm -hmm. that this sort of production of consent happens at the level you know in schools and the school system the way certain histories are taught yeah the way we come to understand our government as well how legal arguments are framed and the punitive sanctions that they enact as well discourses in the media Mm -hmm. and political debates and these represent yeah these representations as well yeah but again that it's not this sort of conspiratorial cabal that's pulling the string behind everything that once this kind of phrasing is made intelligible in public discourse that it kind of takes on a life of its own and through its the material advantages that are afforded to those who understand the situation and in terms of these frameworks uh, they become all the more powerful and all the more intelligible yeah so the way that it has this sort of idea that the the sort of buying into a particular signification or like signifying framework is kind of the thing that actually grants one a sense of like power and mm-hmm. like grants those frameworks a sense of power too mm-hmm. it's like we're constantly co-creating them all the time right yeah i mean you can't go on like cnn or something and start describing this like in-depth marxist analysis of how the bourgeois proletariat government is formed and expect to have any sort of intelligibility with the other pundits there yeah i mean that's a really interesting thing too because it's almost as if if you were to start talking about things in this way it would be so fundamental mentally alien to the whole entire theoretical consensual framework (laughs) that Mm -hmm. everyone operates in those institutions. It's almost like it doesn't even register or... I do wonder if it would be that, oh, well, you just label something as like socialist or communist and then you don't have to engage with it. It becomes completely like disavowed and sort Mm -hmm. of excluded from the the sort of general institutional framework. Yeah, exactly. And I don't want to get into this, uh, you know, the like Trump tagline that the media is corrupt and everything like that. But I think he's right, but in the wrong way. (laughs) Yeah, I I think that's maybe true that there. Yeah, that it's sort of representative of this ideological consensus that exists and the inability to operate outside of of that consensus yeah perhaps. which he in himself is completely implicated in like, right that's the exactly thing, right? it's uh-huh. like there's this like lacanian idea that an ideological critique is never sort of never powerful unless you also include yourself within it mm. and that's the thing about trump and that whole like discourse and maybe even like nixon's moral majority sort of discourse or silent majority discourse is that you're never included in your criticism of the of the thing that you're leveling mm-hmm. your critique at even though you're part and parcel of it yeah is it, you're a fucking like a primary symptom of it it's like you're always standing outside of it right exactly yeah and it's it, especially ironic that like here the head of state with you know it's hard to imagine like how much more power could be concentrated in a single person yeah. with the ability to to kind of change that but instead it ends up being this i don't know, you know this reactionary kind of approach to mm-hmm. understanding the ideological consensus yeah kind of going back to why the state needs to be relatively autonomous too is you can see the importance of that relative autonomy for this production of consent as well 
that when the state is relatively autonomous from 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 the ruling class, even though it's fundamentally a ruling class institution, well, that relative autonomy makes it appear as if it's governing on behalf of the people more. Mm. It helps to produce that consent that's operating. And there's this way in that once this coercion and the production of se- of consent reach a certain level, you have this period of hegemony where the state have has a sufficient level of that consent. And once that happens, the fact that the state is a ruling class institution becomes obfuscated and hidden mm. because the consent is as hidden that state's essential nature. So at that point, would you say that the state appears almost as if it's this kind of like enlightened objective institution that doesn't have these sort of like very class-based characteristics. Right. And I think that's also why, you know, it needs to sort of regulate some some ruling class fra- fractions from time to time in order to appear that it is it is separate from those mm-hmm. ruling class institutions. But again, it can't touch the essential that it has to preserve capitalism and those unequal material relations. I'm actually thinking about the the complete lack of any sort of uh, significant response to the economic crisis, the recession in 2000. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. It was that, oh, OK, yeah, we're the state and we're like going to put banks in their place or we have this sort of autonomy. But then whenever it pushed him to shove, it was that what it was a seven hundred thirty four billion dollar bailout. Mm-hmm. And like no one went to fucking jail. Or I think one person did or a few bankers did, but they were these like low level mid man managers at these trading firms right yeah Yeah. so the idea was is that well we can sort of give the appearance that we're disciplining sort of the financial markets and like you know the wall street and like the banking sort of powers that be but we're not actually going to touch the core Mm -hmm. of what actually is going on yeah there are these kind of slaps on the wrist um that target certain fractions but don't touch the essential yeah i i get it's interesting to me because i don't think when you think of that or talk about that normally i don't think we sort of realize that it isn't just this like conspiratorial sort of like framework of like, oh, like the bankers control everything and that's why nothing's going to happen. It's like, well, what we're maybe actually seeing is that there has to be this sort of appearance of some sort of semi-autonomy precisely to preserve the illusion that like the state is something different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think one of the important facets of this production of consent is it also grants more credibility to when the state does end up using coercion mm. because, you know, the state can s- start disciplining labor movements and policing them because it's perceived to be operating on behalf of the majority or the people and this is why a good point. Yeah. democracies mm-hmm. like emerge in these these advanced capitalist societies is so that they can appear to be acting on behalf of the people so i'm wondering would you say that this kind of goes back to this sort of idea of leviathan from thomas hobbes as well that the state in itself is sort of this conglomeration of everyone's interests and because we all consent to be governed by the state whenever it does operate with brutal coercive violence the general rationale to be is like well this is what you wanted this is for you that Uh, we do this right yeah and this idea of the social contract that emerges and this like peak classical liberalism yeah in europe uh that that the state is sort of this this entity for these classical liberals not that the state is an entity that doesn't act on behalf of the ruling class but on behalf of of the majority of everyone this yeah. this social contract kind of interpretation yeah uh, kind of ironic too that the contract is you know one of the essential capitalist objects as well that That's governs right. how wage wage labor is related yeah and depending on the theories of capitalist historical development the contract and and how we legally define private property is seen as the core feature that allowed capitalism to develop in the way that it did. So. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now that we've maybe kind of clarified some of these terms about coercion and consent, we can bring it back to this moral panic around mugging. Mm-hmm. So for Hall, Hall sees this moral panic around mugging as a symptom of of these economic crises that are occurring in in 60s and 70s Europe and the the corresponding crisis of hegemony that the state then faces mm-hmm. in terms of in terms of relegating uh, or yeah sort of dealing with these these economic crises. So I, I think maybe maybe just for some kind of historical context here, I think the 60s and 70s are widely seen as when this 
this notion of the kind of welfare state, the Fordist Keynesianism state Mm -hmm. that exists in throughout the world, really, starts to become dismantled or Mm -hmm. starts to encounter crises that it can no longer handle. Yeah. And so you see sort of more labor strikes, student militancy, the black power movement and African independence movements as well. And for Britain, they're having to deal with this open warfare that's emerging in Northern Ireland too. And the kind of fundamental inability of the the Fordist Keynesianism state to to handle some of these crises. So since these words get thrown around a lot today, would you say that this is for Hall the generative moment for what we call neoliberalism? liberalism now and policies of austerity, where the state starts to be dismantled, things are privatized precisely as a way to respond to these crises. Right. Yeah. And I think there's no sort of material necessity that there necessarily needs to be a dismantling of the welfare Mm -hmm. state at this moment, but it sort of speaks to the success of the war of position that sort of conservative ideologies have waged and the success of, of them on this front that the form the state takes after these crises was able to be one of this more sort of like Reaganism conservative yeah. form. And and sort of that war of position that was being waged, and in, in some ways they were tremendously successful, goes back to the rise of the theories of uh, Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman out of mm-hmm. what was called the uh, Mont Pelerin Society, which there's a great book that Philip Morawski has written on that. That's a collection of essays about the birth of what we call sort of like this like libertarian, right-wing, hyper-capitalist sort of ideology and how that actually came to have the sort of cultural power that it did. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so like this is sort of the the result of, of a very successful waging of the war position by the right wing. Right. And that even though these sort of these different facets, you know, this economic academia perspective from mm-hmm. Milton Friedman and the Chicago School is relatively independent from the Nixon political campaign, yeah. they still have this resonance that contributes to their increased intelligibility and increased power in, in social discourse. Do you remember when we discussed once an article by the political theorist? William Connolly, and he had this idea of what he calls a resonance machine. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Was this about like cowboys and, and, evangelicals or something like yeah, that? Yeah, so it was It was essentially the idea of why is it that uh, evangelical Christianity seems to work so well with uh, like hyper-capitalist, like libertarian ideology? Because on, on some level, you don't think that they would actually work right, together. Right, that there's a lot of contradictions. Yeah, yeah, but his basic underlying principle of why they resonate and can work together is because they both see like the material world as being finite and not mm. worth our time. And so we can just brutally exploit it and, mm. and like destroy it with without any uh, sort of repercussions because on some level, like the material world is not the realm of God. Mm. And anyway, I just, I was thinking about this because I remember after we read that article, there was just this way that everyone started just using the phrase resonance machine to describe yeah. everything. And it had no fucking coherence. <laughs> <laughs> it just sounded really cool. I mean, it is pretty catchy. It's a good I, phrase. Yeah. yeah. There, I mean, I remember him drawing more on like Deleuze and Guattari He's, in that yeah, article. Yeah, was real into Deleuze and Guattari. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, I've kind of bastardized this phrase resonance now or resonance machine. <laughs> It's, it's one of those things where it's just like, yeah, sure, okay, that sounds fine. Uh-huh. I mean, it's like Deleuze using the phrase nomadic war machine to yeah. describe all sorts of just like, yeah, I mean, who cares what it means? That's why there's that meme about, like, explain Deleuze to me or I'll fucking uh, kill yeah. you. Don't dumb it down. They've and taken it, out a life of its own. Yeah, yeah, because I think it's almost like it's built into their sort of way of theorizing things in mm. itself is that it's almost like, yeah, I mean, no one really knows what this mm-hmm. shit means. So. Yeah, and philosophy was just some creation of concepts. Yeah, that, that's right. That's and what, the proliferation of those concepts. That's right. We also read that together. Yeah. Well, we tried uh, to. At least the the beginning. Uh On that slide digression, where are we going, Maximus? (laughs) Okay, so anyways, bringing it back to maybe these these crises of hegemony that Uh occur when the state's unable to to mitigate these economic crises that are happening in the 60s and 70s. Here, the particular ideological form that happens is this kind of moral panic around mugging Mm -hmm. and the way that the this almost police state is re-entrenched as a way to to deal with some of these crises so okay i guess maybe sort of the before we get into that we kind of have to discuss that hall's hall's perspective is that these economic crises don't sort of get represented as such in public discourse Mm -hmm. but rather they take the form of this moral panic around mugging instead Mm -hmm. and that these kind of nebulous ambient fears about maybe what's happening to people's material of way of life 
their quality, their standard of living doesn't manifest itself in terms of an anxiety about the future of capitalism as such, but rather manifests itself as an anxiety about immigrants and about muggers yeah. and about this this threat of a violent crime that's happening on the streets instead. So it gets sort of displaced onto these other groups or like obviously groups that would stand in as being like alien or the other, or like these sort of like oppressed masses from over there. And that's where we sort of direct our anxiety. Right, exactly. And bringing it back to kind of sim- signification spirals mm-hmm. again, that this, that this, so-called subversive minority is linked to to these larger nebulous threats and anxieties that people are feeling as these economic crises are striking them. But, you know, the scapegoating of, of muggers and immigrants ends up being a way to hide the contradictions of capitalism that are ultimately causing those economic crises. On this show, we always like to say that we're anti-hot take, and we are uh, more in favor of what we call ice-cold motherfucking takes. Okay. I just have to tell you, this is Hall delivering a staggering ice-cold motherfucking take. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Just wanted to say, acknowledge that. Mm-hmm. Big ups to Stuart Hall. And it's lines like this that you read, and then you just you have to sit down or something, because they're just so powerful. Yeah, you yeah. just fucking shook, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and also, again, very relevant, I can think about most discussions in American politics and, and the sort of, you know, reemergence, or if you want to call it that, of like a sort of more left-wing anti-capitalist sort of perspective, I think is starting to rediscover this kind of critique. Right, yeah. And I think one of the, like, immensely frustrating things for me is that, you know, this book was published in 1978. We've known about this for yeah. 40 years now. Yeah, that's right. And the more I read about the history of the 60s and 70s and sort of like the false uh, or the unrealized promises of some of these radical rebellions and revolutions is that I'm like, fuck, all this existed and the theory sort of existed to describe it back then and we're sort of, we haven't really budged from that, from where we were in the 60s and 70s. I I think that is so crucial and I found myself really going back and trying to study that particular period so much more in depth for exactly that reason and Mm -hmm. to try to understand what Mark Fisher would call the lost futures of Mm -hmm. those exact sorts of movements and Mm -hmm. how they failed, they lost, they were brutally defeated in right. some instances, and we're still dealing with the same uh, sort of repetition of that situation, mm-hmm. I think. And that's why this sort of, this Hall book feels so contemporary, and that's... It's crazy that it was written 40 years ago, because it feels like you could read this as if it was written yesterday. Right, and that's simultaneously kind of the ironic tragedy of it all, that yeah. our politics looks fundamentally the same as it yep. did in 1978. Eternal repetition of the same. Mm-hmm. Welcome to the neoliberal hellscape. Ha- history repeats itself first as tragedy, then as farce. Yeah, and then as as, I don't know, what what comes after the farce? I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to think of some silly cultural reference I can make, but I haven't seen a silly movie in, in ages, so. Probably like the first is tragedy, then as farce, then as Sharknado. Is that fair? <laughs> <laughs> I was actually going to say first is tragedy, then as farce, then as TikTok. <laughs> okay, yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. Or like the first is tragedy, then as farce, then as Fortnite. <laughs> Or maybe then is new sincerity. Ooh. That was a little bit of a shot <laughs> fired over at you, Comrade Max. <laughs> yeah, I've... Well, it's the, maybe... I don't know. That's another there's gonna, podcast. To, yeah. To, to is there going to be so like fun. some Wes Anderson version of Policing the Crisis that <laughs> for the new sincerity version? You know what's funny? I'm actually wondering if you would have made like the young Karl Marx and oh, like if that would have been like a Wes Anderson <laughs> film. <laughs> Maybe that's what it would show up as. <laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. God, if something like that ever gets made, I'm just, I'm going to go move out into the woods and become a full blown like, <laughs> anarcho primitivist. I'm just going for it at that point. I'd probably be right there with you. Too. I'll, I'll build a shack for two of us. Then. <laughs> Okay, so I guess we've kind of seen sort of how these crises of hegemony get represented in 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 public discourse mm-hmm. as as this threat of the the immigrant and you know threat of violent street crime as well. I guess maybe we can go on to now some of the updates that that Hall has around Marx's theory of the lumpen proletariat that mm-hmm. he introduces in the 18th Brumaire and maybe how it rela- relates to ghettoization and, and black youth as well. So I guess maybe we can just start with a discussion of the lumpen proletariat here. That would be good. I mean, this is a class of people that Marx introduces in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon and kind of 
tough to de- well i don't, don't know how to really describe them formally other than some examples they're kind of people who are intermittently employed mm-hmm. kind of the street hustler kind of yeah. class maybe it's like they don't they're not incorporated into the economic structure in the same way as like the working classes would be right yeah they're specifically distinct from the proletariat who has this kind of regular late wage labor mm-hmm in factories and i i think because of that distinction marx kind of saw them as not a fundamentally revolutionary class yeah because they were sort of they were they were far away from from the most peak capitalist development and relations that existed in in factories which with wage labor as yeah. well unless you're a modern day maoist and you think that the lumpen proletariat are the most revolutionary class and so this is <laughs> yeah. also a legacy of the new left too because a lot of those like really hardcore militant groups of the of the new left especially in the states like the symbionese liberation army and eventually what was like the black liberation front i mean essentially they were looking for the new revolutionary subject and eventually they landed on the limp and proletarian mm. and so basically they would break people out of jails and or if you were you know had been incarcerated at some point and you got out or you were involved in like street gangs and shit like they basically were, were trying to recruit you into their like militant mm. movement to go bomb post offices and shit like that oh wow yeah usually there are only about like 10 or 12 of them at the most in any one of these groups and but yeah there was a point where god i just read a, a really interesting book of this it's called um, days of rage uh, okay. about this whole period and these groups and there was i can't remember what year it was exactly but it was something like in one particular year there were like thousands upon thousands of bombings by these groups oh geez yeah i mean it was wild it was absolutely wild and it's one of those periods that is just of this era that's completely lost in our imagination Mm -hmm. to understand like how this all played out. And there's little history about it too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was, that book was actually one of the few ones I could find about uh, like a general overview of that period and those sort of militant left-wing groups. Yeah. And I think Hall kind of falls into this, uh, this group of people that, believes in the the revolutionary potential of the Lupin proletariat. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he really grounds it in this historical analysis of the forms that capitalism has taken in in 1970s Britain to to give an intellectual coherence to that that position here. Mm -hmm. You know, for Hall, you know, these Lupin proletariat are precisely the people that are policed by this this public reaction to to the so-called mugging crisis that's that's occurring. And because they're the the site of the state's coercive reaction and the state's un, the state's reaction to these economic crises in the subverted form, that the lumpen proletariat is in this way acutely aware mm. that the state is fundamentally a ruling class institution because it sort of faces the brunt of its coercive power most directly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. and they have sort of a, a more awareness as to yeah how to tackle that then and to understand it in those terms and rupture this ideological consensus that exists elsewhere around in in terms of the ideological consensus that may that the lumpen proletariat should be policed they're the best position to challenge that so i'm wondering looking at hall's analysis and and his promise that he places in in that particular i mean because it's it's interesting because for marx marx would have described the reason why the proletariat was the most revolutionary class was because of their structural position Mm -hmm. in the economy and hall's sort of singling out the lumpen proletariat as also existing in the sort of structural position, but it's mm-hmm. the structural position of facing the most brutal coercion by the state. Right. Yeah. So yeah. they do exhibit this like very strong material relation and material condition, mm-hmm. even though it's not this particular like wage labor form. Yeah. It takes a different form of appearance, but it's fundamentally the same material relation underneath. I'm wondering, I mean, just to have a sort of critical way of thinking about this, how much do you think Hall's hope and the in the potential of them them, you know, being a, a sort of unified group that could push back and like challenge the state precisely because the state is enforcing the sort of uh, response to these economic crises. I mean, how much do you feel that that promise is something that still exists? Yeah, this is a really interesting question because Hall's analysis kind of stops right at this right point there. at the question of tactics yeah. and and what to do then. So for Hall, I think he doesn't see, you know, mugging and street crime as a revolutionary action per se, but rather this quasi-revolutionary action that's maybe speaking to a certain material condition and mode of relation, even if it doesn't directly 
challenge that that relation it's sort of an expression of their acute awareness uh, that the state is is cracking down coercively and re-entrenching its ruling class interests but hall seems to suggest that more needs to be done in order to turn this kind of quasi political act of, of mugging and street crime into something that's actually revolutionary. I wanted to pull a quote here yeah, go for it. that happens at the end where he says, but it constitutes a powerful reminder that we should not mistake a proto-political consciousness for organized political class struggle and practice. It sets up a necessary warning about any strategy which is based simply on favoring current modes of resistance in the hopes that in and of themselves by natural evolution rather than by break and transformation, they could become spontaneously another thing. So I think that's, you know, where Hall kind of sees his role too as an intellectual is it's kind of this jumping off point where he kind of can take these quasi political acts and give them a more sort of a more revolutionary basis and articulation. Yeah, I think that's also his Gramscian influence showing through as well. This idea of the organic intellectual as someone who takes sort of the the natural like sort of ways of living or like responses or ways of thinking of a particular class and hones them into a definitive, clear uh, political position and project. Mm-hmm. I, I'm wondering... Would you say that Hall, the way that he describes mugging as being this like proto-revolutionary act but requires more, would actually be similar to what MLK would say about riots, that they're the language Mm. of the unheard, but they don't necessarily have this coherent political project that they're able to achieve. Right. I think that's spot on Mm. and that there needs to be like further political class struggle to really, you know, turn that into something more and articulate it into something powerful. I mean, one other thing, too, because I actually find this is a really relevant, uh, critical discussion to have about the way that political subjectivity is talked about now, especially around over-policing and brutal police violence on, like, communities of color and, like, everything else, especially in the U.S., is this idea that whenever we think about being at sort of the, having the boot on your neck the most starkly and most dramatically from the state and from these, like, larger economic crises and who deals with the the sort of brunt of the force of, Mm -hmm. of how that's responded to, I sometimes think that there's this idea that, well, if we're the closest ones to that effect, we're going to have the the best response to it. Mm. But I do wonder sometimes if we could think about it in the way that Hall's talking about, because Hall has this great way of saying, yes, we can recognize that there's the potential. There's a proto-revolutionary way that you might see that being responded to, Mm -hmm. but it also requires something more. And maybe that's the role of sort of like a class political analysis to unify like these proto-revolutionary responses into Mm -hmm. a coherent project. The thing that I keep thinking about is this actually is something I I found really uh, helpful in some of the work of Vivek Chibber, who wrote Spectres of Capital. It's sort of a critical look at um, post-colonial studies um, from a Marxist lens. But he has this really uh, fascinating idea where he says that whenever we're thinking about how is it that this hegemonic sort of cultural ideological production, like why does it keep us in place the way that it does? He said that there's coercion, there's consent, but there's this other uh, response to it that's equally if not more powerful in its resignation. Mm. And I wonder if that's also something we have to be really focused on to think about this, that sometimes, I mean, you know, as someone who works a lot with trauma and the impact of trauma, um, particularly not just on an interpersonal level, but on a larger structural level, it is not uncommon that nihilism and resignation and being hyper apolitical is absolutely a common response to these Mm -hmm. sorts of conditions. And I think that has to be something that's very critically incorporated into how we think about this stuff too. Right, yeah, that we can't retreat into some sort of cynicism or something about our current current political situation. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking too, Hall talks about this, there's a refusal refusal to work uh, movement that emerges in in kind of these ghettoized communities as mm-hmm. well and that you know Hall kind of recognizes that there is some kind of quasi political potential in there in that it's kind of rejecting the specific wage labor form and relation but then he says you know that kind of political potential is undermined when these crises of capitalism occur and the refusal to work becomes less of political stance and more kind of just ends up being the economic situation that a bunch of people find themselves in regardless yeah and you know that ends up undermining any sort of quasi political potential that that movement then had. Yeah, and I think a lot of times, especially in the States right now, it always strikes me that the greatest weakness of a lot of liberal sort of critiques and responses to things like militarization of the police and, you know, the fact that we live in a a low-intensity police state pretty much every Mm -hmm. moment of every day 
is the idea that, going back to an old phrase from uh, Rosa Luxemburg, the idea that you can reform these institutions without having to address the larger structural things that they're a response to mm. is fundamentally always going to be insufficient mm. and maybe not even that effective because we can talk about over policing all day and there's obviously elements and histories of racial signification and like division and segregation and also like we can never forget that there's an economic larger system that these things are embedded in. It's kind right. of the way that the Field Sisters in their analysis of race has, a, they have this great phrase where they say, sometimes we look back at, you know, the slave labor system in the U.S. and we think that slavery was about the, the reproduction of race as opposed to the reproduction of cotton, mm. you know? And it's like, we have to understand there's a material basis and component to these sorts of ways that race and segregation and stuff mm-hmm. function. And I think it's something that in some ways called, you know, years before they were thinking of it this way, Call is also anticipating this, that we have to think about these larger structural aspects that this is working within. Absolutely. Yeah. And Hall's analysis of race in particular really shines here too in this kind of material analysis. Uh, Because for Hall, sort of like this class of black youths that he analyzes in policing the crisis is this specific fraction of the class. And, you know, he sees racism not as sort of this discrete stead set of institutional or individual biases but rather racism as an interlocking structure that exists between and amidst all of these different institutions and for hall one of the particularly interesting things i think he says is that the that racism works to reproduce this class as well the specific class fraction and ice cold motherfucking tape i know right yeah i it, this line that i pulled is race is the modality in which class is lived Woo. i know Woo. yeah that's good stuff <laughs> uh-huh that and you know that racism operates to you know, in this kind of social reproduction of the working class, not just as a way to kind of separate like the white working class from from the black working class or other minority working classes, but also as a way with which to undermine the confidence of uh, of black identity yeah. and reproduce them as a class that is, you know is fundamentally subaltern. You know what I love about Hall's analysis on this too that it's so it's so pushes back around this conversation that I think happens a lot, uh, at least in the States, because there's this resurgent leftist anti-capitalist movement. And now we're back to these debates about, oh, are you like a race reductionist? Are you a class reductionist? Mm -hmm. And the the important thing about reading someone like Hall is just like, that's a bullshit false way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, some people would push back on this and say that class at the end of the day still is like the primary thing or race gets reproduced precisely in these sort of class divisions. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the very least, it's just to say that the idea that it's like one or the other is just completely disconnected from a lot of the work that's been done to try to understand the relationship between the two precisely by people like Stuart Hall. Right. And this is why his arguments are so relevant and important to deal with today. Mm-hmm. And maybe there's a bit of a shout out to intersectionality analysis here too. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the way of understanding race and class as these interlocking structures that, you know, you can't necessarily reduce one to the other, but the different structures derive their power from the way that they interact with these, with these various categories. I was uh, talking with someone the other day about, about intersectionality and whenever you ask people because this is you know a word that gets utilized all the time especially Mm -hmm. in a more left like liberal political uh sorts of venues and if you ask someone like hey like where do you think intersectionality came from or how did it develop and you know usually the answer will be kimberly crenshaw and the sort of like legal studies like critical race theory sort of mode Mm -hmm. but again one of those things that kind of gets lost in the history is that the sort of even earlier development of this as a concept came from the Combahee River Collective. Mm -hmm. And they were explicitly fucking socialist and Marxist. And I always think the way that they thought about this is so crucial because they would say that, yes, like everyone shows up to politics with their lived experience, but that's always the starting point. Like Mm -hmm. you can't reduce being political to just what someone's lived experience is. There has to be this, this sort of next move, which is exactly what Hall's trying to talk about, which is mm. how do you take these sort of like proto forms of like revolutionary consciousness and then unify those and build something that is shared across 
identities. And mm-hmm. I think to me, that's why it's always important to sort of understand that sometimes the way that intersectionality gets talked about and where you define the origin is in itself an ideological sort of mm, effect. Yeah. And so to me, it's always like, hey, just so you know, like the originators of that idea were also fucking socialists. They were a bunch mm-hmm. of like queer, black, you know, women socialists. Just it's important to remember that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's not to sort of like reduce all these these racial analyses to the level of the economic or the material. Yeah, absolutely not. Um, yeah. And Hall articulates this well, where he sort of says that now that sort of capitalist power operates through race, mm-hmm. race also becomes like a primary means with which to to challenge it. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the most powerful and helpful phrases I've ever heard is that whenever you get into these discussions about, oh, is it class first or is it race or gender first? The important thing to remember is that, well, where you find yourself now, it's important to know that, well, the way that class and race and gender or how race and gender sort of function is that they're functioning in the particular way that they are because they're also sort of interlocked with the systems of economics Mm -hmm. and class. And it's important to just know that because of that, they function in this very particular way based on or like sort of based in that. But that doesn't mean that now they're not like primary and necessary features of how capitalism continues to reproduce itself. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, one of the best historical examples of this I've heard actually has to do with the caste system in India. So right whenever British colonialism and like colonization of India was sort of first ramping up, there's this great historical study where they were looking at the caste system in India at the time was actually starting to kind of like be very undermined and sort of like starting to be dismantled. Hmm. But it wasn't until capitalism sort of incurred and the British incurred upon India that they actually saw the caste system as a very, very useful tool for segregating and dividing the population, which could then Mm -hmm. help them exploit certain groups in the wage labor system. Right. The social reproduction of class. Absolutely. And this is why social reproduction theory is so important here. But the, the crucial thing was that capitalism actually benefited from the caste system itself and they reinforced that caste Mm. system to help them be able to carve up and utilize wage labor to produce profit in the way that it did so it's it's just really important to understand like capitalism like sort of lives and breathes on creating these distinctions and divisions and making them integral to how it functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know Hall was influenced too by, by Catherine Hall, his wife, who is a, who is a feminist sociologist as well too. So yeah, Hall also kind of discusses the sexual division of labor Mm -hmm. and how that serves to reproduce certain class structures as well. Well, Maximus, how are we doing, man? I mean, we're kind of touching on maybe some of the relevance of the book today. Um, Is there any Mm -hmm. last thoughts or ideas or points you wanted to touch on? I mean, I don't think so. Not really, nothing in particular, I think. I mean, I think we've kind of conveyed the the strength of this book and its relevance to stuff today. I have a feeling like half a dozen people after listening to this are going to go out and buy Policing the Crisis. Yeah, and also, I mean, maybe check out that other podcast about Sewer Hall that Ben Carrington did. But yeah, I mean, again, I would highly recommend his book, uh, Representation, phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Uh, has one of the best introductions to Foucault that I've ever seen. Yeah, but I mean, Stuart Hall, fantastic. He, yeah. Well, he died not that long ago. I I think so. Yeah. And that's why they did that other podcast yeah. too. Yeah. The other, I recommend, uh, what is this black and black popular culture by yes. Stuart Hall? Yes, it's a little bit that. more cultural. I remember less sort of material analysis emerging there, but that's always informing everything he does. Yeah. It's a great article. Uh, Hall also has this analysis of South Africa's economy mm-hmm. too. I forget the name of it, but you know, that's sort of a really great intro to his methodology and his, his means of historical material analysis. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, Max, I don't know. Final thoughts? Anything on the relevance of this book for you or or sort of what you take most from this as a political subject mm-hmm. existing I'm, in the world? Yeah, I mean, it's it's given me a new appreciation for kind of the role that the lumpen proletariat can play mm-hmm. in class revolution, as well as a sort of means of understanding some of the different moral panics that we're seeing today yeah. and that are constantly emerging and the way that those those moral panics are, are being mobilized to push a certain political agenda. Yeah, I think so too. And just always know that lurking, disembodied, and ethereal in the background of every moral panic is usually an economic structural right. issue of one yeah. kind or another. Yeah. And this, this production of consent, I think, especially really hit home yeah. for me in terms of re-examining the 
political debates that have been existing in our in U.S. politics for a while, yeah. and you know the same terms that those are all operating on. And I think it, it's it's really radicalized my politics a lot in terms of you know I think that there are these serious economic crises that you know broader crises as well that have been brought on by by capitalism and it's made me question some of the more effective ways to challenge those and cause me to re-examine some of the ideological consensus that exists around how markets operate and their efficacy and led me to like much more different political views there. That's pretty awesome considering, you know, over the years that we've known each other, it feels like that you've sort of been making your march leftward on the the standard political continuum. Uh, yeah, so, I think so too. Yeah. And it, I mean, I'm kind of overwhelmed by this democratic primary as well, but this is helping me kind of distill at least broadly which ideological camp I fall into. You know, and I think what I love too about Hall so much is that he really was a true public intellectual, mm-hmm. you know, and the fact that you can read this book and it can, it can have that much of an effect on you. And I mean, Hall's had a huge effect on me speaks to the sort of role of thinking about things in terms of theory and historical analysis mm-hmm. on how we think about politics and day-to-day issues. So to me, that's sort of a real sign of its power is that it can realistically make you change your worldview about things. Right, yeah. And one of the strengths of cultural theory in general, too, and cultural studies is a way to re-examine some of these kind of quotidian cultural artifacts yeah. that in movies and music that we're faced with every day and really explore like new radical potential within them and and the way that they signify different ideologies as well yeah comrade maximus thanks so much for having me on here it's been a pleasure yeah this has been a great one so i'm wondering let's say i know you're going to be going back to your your home state well, I just, I don't know, not your home state, but where the state that you're in now. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. I don't know. I'm wondering about maybe a future episode we could do together. I think so. Out. Yeah. Maybe some more, some more hall or maybe a Gramsci episode too. Yeah. If we haven't done a Gramsci one specifically, but that would be pretty interesting. Uh, okay. I know you're hinting at doing a, an extended series on like a Marxist analysis of the state. So. Yeah, I am. I want to read some like Ralph Miliband and Nikos Palancis and maybe some mm-hmm. others and like mm-hmm. do kind of a, like a short series of like three, four episodes, like just on their their theories of the state from mm. a Marxist perspective. Yeah, Poulantzis is another arth- author in here that Hall references a bunch that I'm not familiar with at all, in fact. Yeah, um, I've read a handful of his books, and he's a pretty big influencer on me in, a, in some different ways. But yeah, I mean, we could always have you on for one of those. That might be a good follow-up. Sweet, to yeah. All right, well, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right, thank you, Comrade Maximus, for your, your service to the revolution. Woo! Are you going to go out and mug someone now? <laughs> it's and only a, a quasi, pro- quasi-revolutionary <laughs> act. So <laughs> yeah. I'm going to do full-on revolutionary instead. Yeah, so which basically means you're going to go like, well, I don't want to say that. I don't want to get you arrested. So <laughs> just this is going to be on your CV at some uh-huh. point. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, well, maybe com- not anymore. We'll see. Yeah, well, we'll see. Now that we've done the episode, I'll leave it up to you how you want to <laughs> use this for your career advancement. Mm-hmm. So, you know, does this qualify as, as uh, social, cultural capital, you think? I think so. Yeah, definitely public outreach and yeah. mm-hmm, broader impact. All right. Well, that, that'll be yours now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Well, Comrade Maximus, thank you for your service. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Thanks, Comrade listeners. Uh, we'll see you next time. Peace. As Ice Cube says in that little sound clip we put in the show, fuck the police, coming straight from the underground. Yes, indeed, Ice Cube. Yes, indeed. Big shout out to Comrade Maximus for joining us this week, coming in the library, laying down that knowledge, helping us learn about Stuart Hall. You know, I have to say, this episode is exactly the reason why I wanted to do this show in the first place. Getting to bring these sorts of works that are lost in the historical archives, but just as relevant and necessary for us to analyze and understand critically our political position we find ourselves in today. So it is a great honor, it is a great privilege to be able to share this one with you, comrade listeners, and we hope you got as much out of it as we did talking about it together. All right, we're going to see you back here next week. Please remember, like, click on stars, keep supporting the show, head over to Patreon, all that other good stuff we mentioned, and until we see you next time, 
Keep fighting, keep dreaming, keep critically analyzing, keep reflecting, keep looking for those nascent revolutionary actions and forms and figuring out how you can unify those across different groups, different identities to help us build a collective revolutionary project. And if the gods smile upon us, maybe this podcast will be a tiny, tiny contribution to that very thing. Until next week, take care of yourselves out there. Red Library out. Peace.